It's good to be with you today. Thanks for coming out through the, it was like whiteout conditions a little bit on our drive-in this morning, so I'm glad everybody's here that could be here today. So our music this morning was certainly focused on the cross because our message today will be focused on the cross as we partake in communion. Now typically we do communion before the service or kind of before the message, but today we're going to change things up a bit and we're going to have communion after the service because I want this morning for us to really look closely at the cross. You know what? I forgot the remote, actually. If you could send that up here, that'd be great. Thank you. I won't be able to, my clicker. So if you do want to uh, open your Bibles, our kind of our focus verse is going to be Matthew 27, 26. Thank you, Nicole. Now we are going to, that's where we're, that's going to be right in the middle of where we're going to focus today, but we're going to go all the way back to the Last Supper, and then we're going to go all the way through to Christ's death on the cross until the veil was torn. So that's a lot of ground to cover, and, I, and, and we'll go through some of it pretty quickly. It'll be more of a narrative today, but we will also slow down as we get to where Christ was on the cross, and we'll look at some of those things in detail. So if you are able to stand, please stand as we read God's word this morning. Matthew 27, 26. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Father, we again come before you, and we just thank you for your word. We thank you for music, Lord, that can lift our hearts before you, Father. And we thank you that you allowed us to be here today. Lord, I pray as we look at your word today that you would help us to see and to understand intimately, to be able to understand what our Savior suffered and sacrificed for us on that cross, Lord, as we prepare for communion. Prepare our hearts for that, Lord. Draw us near to you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. So we'll go back into Matthew chapter 26, verses around, say, 26. So 26, 26, if you want to kind of be there. But Matthew 26, verses 20 through 30, records the events of the Last Supper for us. So Jesus and his disciples, all 12 of them, were here together uh, having the Passover meal. This would have been a Thursday night in April. Uh, average temperatures at that time of year in that place of the world would have been around 75 degrees. And so these men were having this Last Supper, the Passover meal, as it were. And they would have at least been enjoying unleavened bread and wine, among other things. And again, all of the 12 disciples would have been there. And this is where Christ instituted communion or the Lord's Supper that we'll partake in today. This is where that was instituted. And so let's read together Matthew 26, 26 through 29 for some details. It says, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So from here, Jesus will take... His, uh, his disciples, and they will go all but one. Now Judas has left. Jesus sent him out, essentially, to do what he was going to do, which was to betray him. So Jesus takes the remaining men, the other disciples, and they go to the Mount of Olives. And we see the Mount of Olives comes up many times in Scripture. In fact, Jesus was there uh, right before he entered uh, the city on Palm Sunday, uh, just a few days before. But specifically, now they're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, which I know we've, we've read so many times about. And that was actually at the Mount of Olives. And Jesus knew at this point what he was going to suffer uh, at, at the hands of men, but also not only the physical suffering that he would endure, but that he would endure the wrath of God for us. And when they were in the garden, he prayed over three different sessions very intensely to the Father 
And he even asked that if it be possible for this cup to be uh, passed from him, that it would be done, but the, the Father's will would be done. And then sadly, as we know and we'll read here in a moment, the disciples clearly didn't understand the urgency of this moment or the intensity of this moment because they fell asleep while the Lord prayed. So let's, let's read here in chapter 26. We'll go 36 through 46 to see this account in detail. It says, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. This is the only time in Scripture where we ever see Jesus ask God the Father to allow him to avoid a certain course of action. Through his three years of ministry, Jesus boldly and confidently confronted false teachers and narrowly escaped death on multiple occasions. And he did it without hesitation. We've never seen him ask for something to be passed from him. He faced it with confidence and boldness. But here in the garden as he faces crucifixion, the physical pain of crucifixion, and worse yet, enduring the wrath of God as he hangs on that cross, Jesus asked three times if it be possible he could avoid it. It's indescribable the suffering that he must have endured, both the physical suffering, which we'll look at closely, and those hours of enduring the wrath of God. Here we have the perfect Savior of the world, the Holy Christ, who's never sinned, and he endures that wrath that's meant for us. But from here, Jesus is betrayed by Judas and arrested by what Scripture tells us was a great crowd with swords and clubs. Some commentators say that there was up to a thousand people that showed up to arrest Jesus with swords and clubs. They were sent by the chief priests and the elders. His disciples all abandoned him. After they had fallen asleep, as he was going before the Lord, praying in earnest sorrow, now they run away when Jesus is arrested. And so he's left here in the middle of the night to face his enemies, betrayed and abandoned. Now they will bind him meaning they will tie his hands together and bind him and take him away. Now, in Matthew, if we continue to read through his, there's a detail that's not given that is given in the book of John, and that is that he was taken to the house of uh, Annas. Who he, so Annas had been the high priest previously. He had been the high priest for nine years until he was disposed by a Roman official, so he was kind of kicked out of that. Uh, office and the current high priest is his son-in-law Caiaphas okay but Annas still wields a great deal of power he had been the high priest his son-in-law now is the high priest multiple of his sons had been the high priest and so he still has a lot of influence and so what I want to do and you can you can go with me if you want or we'll have it up here we're gonna jump over uh, to John 18 19 to look at the interaction that Jesus has uh, with him because it's not covered in Matthew. And so here in John 18, 19 through 24, it says, it says the high priest, and that means Annas. So they, they refer to him here as the high priest, and you'll see that he refers to Caiaphas as the high priest, and you might wonder, well, why both? It's really just because he had served in that role for so long. So the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. 
I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. This is just the beginning of the physical abuse that Jesus would suffer through his unjust and illegal trial. And we'll cover some of the reasons why it's an unjust and illegal trial, even by Jewish law. So here we have the very creator of the universe. The God that spoke the universe into existence is slapped in the face by an evil pawn in the hands of Satan. But the Lord shows tremendous amount of grace and he does not retaliate. He could, if he would have willed the universe to stop existing at that moment, he could have, and he would have been right to do that. But now he's taken to Caiaphas, the high priest, who again is the son-in-law of, of Annas. So now it's sometime, it's sometime after midnight, okay? And the Lord is taken to the courtyard of Caiaphas's house, and there there's a group of religious leaders. They were already assembled in preparation for for this illegal trial. There was, they, they knew what the plan would be here. So first they tried to find the required two witnesses. That was, that was one thing that they had to have. You had to have two witnesses if you were going to try somebody. So they worked at that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And they had the trial at night, which was illegal. It was supposed to be held during the day. And if it was a capital offense, which this was working out to be, they were trying to execute Jesus, that had to be held in the temple during the day in front of everybody, in the wide open. And they're doing this in secret. But after many false witnesses came, Scripture tells us that they, they had many false witnesses come. They finally found two witnesses who testified against Jesus, and they misquoted what he said. I want to look a little bit at this uh, because of the, just to understand uh, what these men said and what it means. So if you look at Matthew 26, 61... One of the men said, in response to being a witness to what Jesus said, he said, this man, meaning Jesus, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And even these two so-called witnesses did not agree on their accusations of what Christ had said. In Mark chapter 14, 59, that tells us that, that their testimonies did not agree. They did not align. But what Jesus actually said is recorded for us in John 2.19. We'll look at it here. This was when what he had actually said that they were trying to uh, basically accuse him of saying something wrong. Jesus answered them and said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up. He was speaking here of his body, his temple, the body. He was the temple of the Holy Spirit. He was the temple of God. He was God in the flesh. And that they would destroy it, which they will, and he would raise it up in three days. So even if these two witnesses... Who, who misquoted Jesus, even if they had quoted him correctly as to what he said, this is not a criminal offense, and it's certainly not one for capital punishment. So they could not find two witnesses who could even agree on what he said, and even what he did say was not worthy of any kind of sentence, let alone death. But what they wanted to find him guilty on was the accusation of blasphemy. So Jesus remained silent in the, in the face of these ridiculous accusations. And in his anger, Caiaphas demands that he responds in answer to the claim that he is the Christ. So Caiaphas is really pushing on him to say, are you the son of the living God? Jesus answers, not only does he answer affirmative, but he expands Caiaphas' understanding of who the Messiah is. You see, they... Caiaphas and, and those that followed him and many of the Jews then believed that the Messiah would come and be a political Messiah, would free them from Rome. But that's not what the Messiah was to be, and that's not who Jesus was. We can look here and see in Matthew 26, 64, how Jesus answered him. Jesus said to him, after he, Caiaphas has pushed him now to answer, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. 
Now here Jesus is referring to two messianic prophecies that we find in Psalm 110 and Daniel 7.13. Caiaphas understood exactly what Jesus was saying. So, so, so the fact that Caiaphas tears his robe and now accuses him of blasphemy tells us that he knew exactly that Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah, that his answer was yes and affirmative, I am the Messiah, and he expanded it. I found this quote as I was studying for this message from a, com a commentary, the expositor's commentary, as it explained what Jesus had said and what his response was, it says, this is Jesus' climatic self-disclosure to the authorities, and it combines revelation with threat. You see, Jesus was confirming that he was the Messiah, he is the Messiah, in addition to that, he will be at the right hand of the Father, and he will come in power and judgment. So now that he's answered them, let's look at the response in Matthew 26, 66 through 68. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, Christ. Who is it that struck you? So now he's being physically attacked by these evil men. And Jesus continues to patiently endure the physical abuse and the cynical hatred from these men. In the morning, a full council of religious leaders came together and they charged Jesus with blasphemy and agreed that he ought to be put to death. So now they're going to drag him to the governor's house, to the house of Pilate. As the religious leaders accused him there before Pilate, Jesus wouldn't give an answer. Now if we look across all the four Gospels at this account of when he was in front of Pilate, we see that Pilate couldn't understand why they wanted to uh, put him on the cross. That he, he didn't see where he was guilty. The book of John actually gives us some of the details of what Pilate asked him, some of the questions that he was asking him. And we read in Matthew that even Pilate's wife had sent word to Pilate saying, have nothing to do with this righteous man. She had, she had been told in a dream that they should not proceed with this. And then in the book of Luke, we find that Pilate tries to find another way to pass the buck, one more way to get out of this predicament. He did not want to be in this position. So he sent Jesus to Herod because he had learned that Jesus was from Herod's district and that Herod happened to be in town at the time. So I'm going to look briefly at this with you on Luke 23, 7 through 11, to see this interaction between Jesus and Herod. And when he, meaning Pilate, when he learned that he, meaning Jesus, belonged to Herod's district or jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. He was hoping Jesus would come and do some miracle. That's not what Jesus was there for. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. Jesus wouldn't answer him. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. So they put some fancy clothes, a fancy robe on him after they mocked him, and they sent him back to Pilate. Now Pilate now offered to free Jesus or Barabbas because it was a custom for each year at this time at the Passover for the governor to free one inmate, as it were. And Pilate knew that if he refused to execute Jesus, and he was the one who had to give the sentence, the Jews could not put him to death. That had to come from Rome. But Pilate knew if he refused to do that, he would have a riot on his hands. And as a, as a Roman political leader, a riot would really lead to one of two things. Either, best case, you get fired and lose your position, or worst case, you get killed and lose your life. So let's look at Matthew 27, 20 through 26, to see this interaction. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. 
I found it interesting when I read this that they don't answer. They don't give any justification. These guys are just, they're just full of hate and evil and want to see Jesus killed. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Now we know he wasn't innocent. He was just trying to show that the guilt wouldn't be on him. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and our children. Then he released them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Pilate went ahead and released Barabbas at the crowd's wishes. Now, Barabbas was a rebel and a known, uh, known conspirator. He, uh, he, w he could have been put to death because of his crimes. But in fact... We know there are three crosses, and one could at least conclude that possibly one of those were meant for Barabbas, but Jesus took his place. Here we see Jesus taking the place of a sinner who wasn't worthy, the first one, let alone all of us. Now, I think it's important that we don't gloss over the fact of Jesus' scourging. It's one little comment here, but it's very important, I think, for us to understand, especially as we prepare to take communion today and understand what Jesus went through. In scourging, Jesus' hands would have been tied to a pole that would have been up, raised up so that his back muscles would be pulled tight. And then a Roman soldier would get a hold of a device that looks like this, which is called a flugellum. It has a wooden handle and it has leather straps on it. And on the end of those leather straps would be tied bone or uh, metal. And then that Roman soldier would whip Jesus' bare back 39 times. And you can imagine what that would do to a person. In fact, it was quite often the case that when somebody suffered this, they would die from it because it would rip open their back and their organs and it would kill them. This was only one more step in the physical suffering that Christ would take on our behalf. He wouldn't die here. After this, the soldiers are going to take Jesus away from Pilate and into another section of Pilate's headquarters. And these men will mock and abuse the very creator of the universe the one who holds their life in his hands. Let's look at Matthew 27, 28 to see the details of that. And then they, meaning the soldiers, stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. This is a wooden reed. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him. And then they took the reed and they struck his head with those thorns bearing into his head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. So at this point, I think it's important for us to remember, Jesus has been up all night long. It's starting to be early hours of the morning, maybe around 8 a.m. He's been up since really, since he was arrested late in the evening prior. He's been bound for probably all night, at least most of the night, he's been bound. He's been slapped in the face. He's had his face spit on. He's been blindfolded and punched and mocked. He's been taunted and lied about throughout the night. And now he's been scourged, which, as I said, in many cases is enough to kill somebody. At this point, he would have lost a great deal of blood. His blood pressure would become dangerously low, and most likely his body would now be in shock. By now, his face would have bruises and cuts and swelling on it, and his back would be torn open, exposing muscles, tendons, and possibly even bone. And now these soldiers take their turn on him. Out of pure evil, nobody directed them to do this. They did it on their own, just in pure cold blood. They mock him and they abuse him physically even further as they put a, thorn, a, thorn, a crown of thorns on his head and then beat his head with a wooden stick as they drive the thorns deep into his skull. At this point, he's already suffered physically in ways that we will never know and we can't understand. Now he's led to Golgotha and to the cross. I found it interesting as I was studying for this that the word excruciating is derived from the words cross and crucifixion. And that's likely because crucifixion is argu arguably the most painful method of death that ever invented by evil human hearts. So now it's about 9 a.m. on Friday. It's Good Friday, as we call it. So Jesus would have been taken to Golgotha and thrown to the ground on his back, adding additional pain and torture from the torn skin and muscles as they rubbed into the dirt and the filth. Then a Roman soldier will take a nine-inch nail or a spike 
and he will drive it through Jesus' wrist into the wood. And then he'll take his other hand and he'll drive another nine-inch spike through his wrist. They don't do it through the hands because the weight of his body on the cross would allow that spike to tear out. So this can hold his weight. We can imagine that as that nail is driven through his wrist, the pain of all those nerves being hit shooting up through his arms and shoulders. Once he's nailed to the beam, most likely, and scripture isn't crystal clear on this, but most likely the vertical beam would already be in the ground. And so Jesus would be stood up and then he would be hung up on that vertical beam. And now the weight of his body is on his arms. Then the Roman soldier would take another nail and drive it through his feet into that vertical beam, allowing his knees to be bent slightly. And the whole weight of his body is now pulling on his wrists, which are nailed to the cross with those two nails. And to breathe, he would have to push up because if he allows his body to sag, he can't get air into his lungs. And obviously pushing up, you're putting more pain into your feet and legs as those nerves shoot pain up through your lower body to get some air into his lungs. With breathing being that difficult, it, it, would, be, it would be very difficult to speak. But scripture has, has for us, records for us, seven times that Jesus spoke while he was on that cross. In three of those times, he was speaking blessing and grace to somebody while he's hanging on, hanging on the cross. He speaks and asks the Father to forgive these vile, evil men of what they were doing. Amazing grace. While he's, while he's hanging on the cross that they nailed him to, he asks that Father God would forgive them. He speaks to tell the repentant criminal on a cross beside him that he will be in paradise with him that day. He speaks to his mother and his disciple John and says that John, he tells John to take care of mother, his mother Mary and says, Mary, John will now be your son. Again, blessing and grace, thinking about others while he's hanging on that cross. He also says that he is thirsty while he's hanging on that cross. Think about the hours of abuse and torture that he's been through, he, how, how, how much he must have thirsted. We also have recorded for us that he cries out asking God why he has forsaken him. This is later in the crucifixion, after he's begun to suffer the wrath of God. And in Luke 24, 23, 46, he says, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. And then the seventh uh, time that we have it recorded for us, and the one that I'm most grateful for, is found in John 19:30, And it simply says, it is finished. This is when he physically died on that cross. And the Bible tells us that there was darkness over the land from noon until 3 p.m. He was on the cross from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m., six hours. But from noon to 3 p.m., there was darkness over the land and other things that happened, which I won't even get into today, that happened in the, that showed that there was judgment happening. But we know from Scripture that darkness equals judgment. And there was a time of judgment as God poured out, God the Father poured out his wrath on Christ on our behalf. He had already suffered unimaginable physical abuse during the prior 12 hours. And now Christ will willingly drink of the cup of God's holy wrath in our place. I want to go back and look at some things that Isaiah wrote about around 700 years before as he prophesied about the Messiah. This is Isaiah 53, 4 and 6. He writes, surely, and this is, he's prophesying about Christ, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, everyone, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then in verse 10 of the same chapter, it says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It was the Father's will to crush the Son. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he, Jesus, shall see his offspring which are his children. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
Jesus took the penalty of our sin over a time period of three hours. And without his sacrifice, we would spend eternity in hell forever enduring that wrath and never pay for it. And when his physical body died on the cross, Scripture records for us that the veil of the uh, temple was torn. The curtain in the temple was torn. What does that mean? So the curtain in the temple separated the holy place from the most holy place. And only one person was ever allowed to go in there one time a year to be that close to God, and that was the high priest. And based on Jewish tradition and history, the curtain would have been around 60 foot high and four inches thick. This is not a small piece of cloth. And it symbolized the separation between God and man. But as, when the Savior died on that cross, we gained direct access to the Father through the Son. Because of, as Scripture tells us, there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So that the moment that Jesus died, Scripture tells us that veil was torn from the top to the bottom, 60 foot tall. All of this Christ did for sinners. It's a sacrifice and a gift for you and for me. It's the only payment that God will accept for our sins. I hope that everybody here today has received that gift. It's a free gift and that you've repented and believed on Christ for salvation and the work that he did, the suffering that he went through for us. If you haven't, make today the day. I pray that it will be. If you have and if you are a child of God, let's today remember and go before God and remember what he's done for us on that cross as we partake of communion together. Let's pray. Father, the amazing grace, the amazing grace that our Savior Jesus showed us, Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you did for us on that cross, how you lived a perfect and holy life, and then you suffered at the hands of vile, evil sinners physically, and you took the cup of wrath from the hand of the Father. Lord, we just thank you for that. And we thank you that you've instituted uh, communion, Lord's Supper, that we could come and remember what you've done for us. And I pray that you would work in our hearts and our minds today as we remember what you've done for us. In Christ's name, amen.